Welcome to episode 16. Here we are. It's going to be vocab this time. I hope you've got out your wordly wise textbooks. (laughs) Yes, I hope that you uh, have polished your anvils of literature and brought your hammers Mm. of wordsmithing because you're a wordsmith and that's the hey. challenge this week was wordsmith <laughs> and we've got a bunch of new words invented by folks out there and m- me and micah ourselves as well um have invented a couple new words for the challenge stick around to the end to hear that but what else are we going to be getting into today well we're going to do a lyrical deep dive yes uh sir. on the song in seekers mm. That's a new word. In seekers is a new word. Boom. Mm -hmm. Uh, But so we're going to dive into that and talk about that a little bit. Yeah. And we've got uh, an interview with a new Right Guys graduate, Brian. That's right. Brian McNeil. So, uh, yes. A great interview that I'm stoked to share. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Why don't we get into what's on your mind? Oh, well, actually. Roll, yeah, roll are we doing intro. the fly through right now? I don't I know. Think so yeah, <laughs> we're I doing think the we've got to roll the intro just like last time. All right, okay. here we go. All right, well here we go. Sweet 16. <laughs> the dirty 16. Some not so sweet. <laughs> not so sweet. A lot, a lot of a lot of parents celebrate their sons and daughters dirty 16. <laughs> I think it's the dirty 30, not the yes, dirty 16. That's correct. <laughs> Oh, well, yeah. welcome to the Dirty 16, the, the best yes, episode sir. in the world. <laughs> vocab, vocab. Oh, wait, we're not going to, we should vo- first talk about your brain. What's on yeah, your mind? Yeah, let's get into the brains first. Let's get that out of the way so that we can then be open and creative. Um, what is on your mind, Ben? Um, okay, well, last time we were here, did I, I had, had just had a COVID, was that right? Yeah, you had yeah. COVID and got over it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, I forgot to talk about last time. I had re- I had just had my brother's wedding, and I what the main writing thing I had been interacting with at the beginning of the summer was writing a roast. I wrote a roast for my brother, oh, nice. and that was like trying to trying to write you know insult comedy. I guess was just like a new sort of writing thing that I was interacting with. And there's I, I'm just disappointed that I didn't bring it up because I did have things to say about it and I don't have that many things to say about it anymore. <laughs> but this month, honestly eh, it's been tougher. Like getting out like the, the creative stuff, like um I've been really working at this one song that um has just been in development for a long time. It was a pretty ambitious project to start off with, but I think I got really lucky at the beginning making a lot of like the early steps um, really well. And then it kind of stalled out near the end. And it's like the last few things that I want to do, I just don't feel confident in myself in the ways that I've been able to reproduce it um, on the track. And so it's just been like really discouraging. Um, I have just been going through a sort of like creative drought on production and so Mm. it's like a really frustrating place to be honestly i get that i totally get that um i too have been in a bit of a drought uh on i basically well so on one hand, I you know on, I was talking about the voice acting stuff um, mm-hmm. last episode, 
and I got invited back for callbacks on this thing, this, uh, this PlayStation game, and heard that it was down to like just uh, me and this other, this me and this other person, and and in the, in the second phase, it was mainly all like famous people who were or famous in voice acting, like people uh, up against, and um, I made it to the top two, and they ended up choosing somebody else. Uh, so that that was a hit. It, I was, I'm also grateful to have gotten to that point in the yeah, process. Definitely. Um, but uh, I was like, okay, well, that dang, I was getting pretty excited about that. Um, and then I had a a slight win with uh, or I I talked about. Did I talk about this? I just I submitted uh, Randy the robot to. Um, to a literary agent we definitely talked about this i'm not sure if it was on the podcast okay okay but yes yeah. all right so I, that that was uh that was a huge thing from the past uh, yeah because that was that was just a, a week ago uh and so all this culmination of getting my my children's book finished and um like the like all the illustrations dialed in the texting the, the lettering the everything the fonts editing everything um finally got it all put together and then researched the hell out of writing query letters and uh researched the hell out of out of literary agents and all this stuff like that and um wrote the first query letter and put together the randy the robot pitch package and sent it out um and that was a milestone uh that celebrated and then um the the, the the thing is though is that these sit in their inboxes for they, they say they'll get back to you in like four to six weeks mm -hmm. and they most of them like they will get back to you if they like it not if they don't so you kind of just sit send it out there and then you wait four to six weeks may or may not get a response yeah so i ended up sending you out to like five mm -hmm. uh five literary agents and each time sending it out takes forever it, it, that's like it's like three four hours of of research and work to like put together the because everything every query has to be perfectly uh um tailored to that agent um oh, and they sure. all have different they all have different like guidelines that they want and everything uh -huh. um so i got that out and uh and then and now it's out to like five but I got to wait like four to six weeks before I hear if they're into it or not. And the, just how long that this whole process has taken, it feels like I just got to a milestone and like pushed it like where you think you're at the top of the hill. And then I'm like, now I'm just in this waiting stage where I'm like, okay, I guess I should start working on book two or should I like, like just not really knowing where to go with my creative energies. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, so what I ended up doing is just switching gears completely. And I've been focusing on my voice and, um, and researching screaming. Like, I don't know what I'm doing, like completely from square one, like going through YouTube and finding people talking about it and all this stuff. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, I found like this, this, like learn how to scream thing. And I just start, I just, I like enrolled in it and started it from, from square one. And, uh, just to see if I could learn any better understanding of what I'm doing. And, um, it's actually helped. And we've got O Sleepers flying out to do this festival uh, next week and uh, in New Hampshire. And we have an hour and 15 minute set time. And I'm just like, good God, that is going to be a beating. That's so many songs yeah. coming out of like not touring or anything like that. Uh -huh. But I've been I've been hitting practice really hard and uh, and and actually had a good a good run through yesterday so that's feeling great. good about that so that was that was kind of that's kind of like the win that I'm the win I'm carrying right now yeah. is but as far as create creative stuff I've just kind of been a little exhausted I guess mm. yeah I'm I mean I I'm frustrated with where I am and it's like 
it's it's a it's like this particular spot in production and at the same time it's like other creative things that i want to do um like i i want to write songs always like i love writing songs and that's not what i where i'm trying to like pour all my energy um but like i have a few that i'm working on that i really enjoy writing and so that's nice i had a i had a show sort of in the past few weeks and it's the first time that i played music for more than like two or three people kind of at a time um and so that was just nice to sort of be heard by a group in like a live feedback setting yeah and to yeah. kind of be on the performance side of it rather than the creative side. To- yeah. Two totally different hats. Exactly. That's mm-hmm. kind of why changing gears to like, I'm just going to work on my voice. Like I, something that is 100% different than sitting here and trying to like write a, a bubbly kid's book when I'm not so bubbly. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, no, when, when Mike and I got on the call today, um, we were both a, like a little bit um, just uh, under the, not under the weather, but um, just a little bit under the radar. I don't know. I under the it. emotional weather. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We were just at both a little bit like um, just sort of um, steamed out on some things that we mm-hmm. were talking about and we said that we wanted to be honest to sort of represent those things when we are in the episode and we don't want to like go on too long about it or anything but yeah just being honest about sort of yeah. our emotional states boys do cry men <laughs> men do cry <laughs> it's good and it's healthy to you know share it negative experiences and emotions and so we're trying we're going to be here for that yeah the ups and downs of it both of us feeling uh discouraged in areas and um and just not like starting out the episode like bah! you know like <laughs> yeah. instead just you know being real with the highs and lows and uh i mean that's human and especially i mean when we're talking about writing and when you dig deep and you write from your soul, like sometimes what's going on in your soul won't, doesn't match the story you're trying to write and, uh, navigating those waters and, um, coming back to the table and, uh, just working on yourself is, is a big, big part of the process, I think. Um, so yeah, anyway, um, I love you, Micah. I love you too, Ben. And I'm proud of you. And I'm here for you, bro. I'm proud of you too. I love you, uh, right, guys, too. Yeah. Thanks I'm for watching. Thanks for thanks for tuning in, guys. And thanks yeah, for listening thanks for to us. Tuning in and tuning in. Mm-hmm. Um. So let's get into it. Yeah. Vocab. Vocab. All right, Micah. What's the longest word you know? Oh wow, that's a good question. Oh. Sh- Shoot, I haven't thought about this since high school. Um, <laughs> uh, it's pneumono uh, volcano. <laughs> uh, are you about to say it? I, I I will if you can't. But new new. Uh, <laughs> God, uh, right. you do know the volcano longest scoliosis or yeah, it's close. What is it? Am I close? Uh huh. It's okay. pneumono ultra microscopic, pneumono silico, ultra microscopic silico, silico volcano coniosis. Yeah, <laughs> pneumono ultra microscopic silico volcano coniosis. Yeah. Oh man, that's a good one. I learned that in Latin class in high school. Nice. <laughs> yeah, nice. we broke the whole damn thing down. That's awesome. I learned that from Ezra in high school. <laughs> And so I'm that, so happy you said that. I haven't thought about that word in forever. So yeah, there's some other long words. So pneumonal ultramicroscopic silicovolcano coniosis, that's a medical term. It's essentially just a bunch of stitched together parts, like Michael was saying he learned in Latin class, but this is was just a way for them to I guess get really specific on a type of black lung that you get from going into a volcano. Mm-hmm. Um 
the other longest words, as far as I know, mostly aren't medical. I mean, like I know a few uh, like r- extremely long words. So that, then after that one, there's um, hippopotamus, sesquipedaliophobia. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what does that mean? It would say it slower. Hippopotamus, sesquipedaliophobia, and you're gonna love this. It's the fear of long words. Dang. It's particularly cruel. <laughs> That's that is particularly cruel. Uh hip so help me say it. Hippo what? Hippopotamonstra. Hippopotamonstra. Sesquipedaliophobia. Sesquipedaliophobia. Mm-hmm. Sesquipedaliophobia. Yeah. Sesquipedaliophobia. Hippopotamonstra sex sequis. Sesquipedaliophobia. Sesquipedaliophobia. <laughs> Hippopotamonstrous sesquipedaliophobia. <laughs> Holy crap. Yeah. That's a good one. Um, the other classic one I know of is anti disestablishmentarianism. Yeah, that's a great one. Yeah. It's, that's kind of what, what I, th- I think that's what I mostly hear around as like the longest word. That's what I mostly hear referenced around it's just like here yeah, this is a, it's a really long word or the longest but does that count as a double negative i mean i i think it does. like obviously if you look at the word but any any given word can just have a definition that isn't really necessarily like a mathematical equation of all the parts combined you know what i mean yeah so like yes in my opinion like i look at it and i'm like yeah that's a double negative wouldn't but that just maybe be establishmentarianism, right? But maybe there's some <laughs> other string somewhere in the logic. I don't know. Like I don't know what establishmentarianism would mean is exactly. True. True. So like maybe that means something specific. That yeah, it's not the negative of that. <laughs> yeah. So like, yeah. As far as I know, the word me- is supposed to mean that you stand against establishments. So. It does seem like it's double negative in a way that it shouldn't be. Well, that is, it's interesting because in all of those examples, we're showing uh, uh, examples of ways to make words where you just attach suffixes and prefixes onto one word and you extend the meaning pretty much. Mm -hmm. And then taking words and putting them, taking freestanding words and putting them together. Yeah. Uh, And... Uh, that like those are two different approaches to to, create, to words. words. Yeah, <laughs> or to, to to creating new words all all together. Yeah, for sure. Do you yeah. um? I there's at one point I was trying to look into what the longest one syllable words are. Oh wow! And it's it's pretty enlightening to think about because it's like a syllable you think of as sort of the unit of difficulty of like saying a word or like the unit of like, but it's really a whole other dimension than difficulty because the longest syllable is not actually very easy to say. Okay. It's just only one syllable. So the longest one syllable word is squirreled. It's 11 letters. (laughs) Squirreled. (laughs) Okay. But it's a mouthful. Like your mouth has to do like eight different things in a row. But it's all in one like motion, and so it's one syllable. Squirreled, squirreled. <laughs> I, I feel like it would be two though. Well, you can definitely break it down like squirreled, but that's not how you, it's just squirreled, and so like that's just it's it's just one little round <laughs> syllable. <laughs> it does feel weird. Squirreled, and like and so some things are obviously way easier to like say than others like um i i i was reading about the the success of different um smart home devices based on the accessibility and ux of the command term okay google has uh three glottal stops in it that's when you make the k or g sound in the back of your throat it's Good one of the model. it's it's one of the more difficult kind of like it's it's one of the more taxing mouth sounds to have to make like in terms of just a momentary like doing multiple in a row 
like giggity 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 is like yeah. pretty pretty kind of like just tough to do back there like your mouth doesn't want to rapid fire back there it's harder so like okay google is like <laughs> pretty like mouthy it's just like a bad way to have to say something whereas like alexa is is like an elegant more uh, elegant words like the amazon alexa is like easier to kind of talk to or call out it feels less awkward yeah to say okay the, google yeah and it's alexa. the same the same kind of yeah, thing as world where like there's it's only one syllable so like it should be kind of like quick and easy to say but it takes longer to say squirreled than it does say like eminem true and it's like three whole letters and like a word in there m and m it's like that's fascinating the uh i i googled uh googled uh, what, what was that what did you say what was that called what was that sound called okay go- go- glottal glottal, glottal. Stop. yeah mm-hmm. those glottal stops um another uh long one syllable word is the word scrunched <laughs> yeah <laughs> which gosh, then i then then that led me to what the hell does scrunched mean because that's a great one uh and it's to make a cru- a crushing noise synonyms mm. would be crackle crunch scrunch that's good crump crumple <laughs> scrunched and then uh a really an old word strength mm. yeah strength is a is another great example i i actually think the word strength is a better like example to strength show how the... hard it can be to, to say a one syllable yeah. word it's just like such strength a... strengths strength. i have several strengths <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's such a sloppy word <laughs> um that's interesting and uh the i the you were you had touched on syllabolic study uh when you were when when well, it was like one of the times we were hanging out and you were showing me how good you could rap <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> i have a story can i tell a story <laughs> yeah <laughs> Wait, i'm gonna shit. get my license revoked <laughs> <laughs> when Shane and I flew up uh, to, to be in Ben's wedding, uh, we were driving and Ben was showing us how well he could rap. I think it was to Busta Rhymes, right? It was a Busta beat, yeah. Yeah, he put a Busta beat on and as he's driving his car, he's rapping it and he's he's in it and it was very impressive and then he hit a car. <laughs> it was a really sharp turn. And, <laughs> and it was somebody see. else in the wedding party. <laughs> <laughs> it was Ellen. She's my now my neighbor. Um, bless her heart. It's like what happened? I was rapping. I was in the cut. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit. <laughs> But oh, yeah, this man. is exactly what Great I'm talking experience. about. It's like squirreled would be a really hard one to work into rap. And like, yeah, rapping fast, the way that I learned to rap fast was to Watsky. And the way that he writes is very like intelligent. It's like it's like the the pen is doing the heavy lifting when it comes to rapping because like you're just lining up syllables that are easy to say after one another. Like gotta be the one to bite the bullet. Like there's mm-hmm. not, there's no part of that, that you have to like repeat something really fast. You can just do a roll from like the back of your tongue to the front basically. And there's an, it's like, as long as you just can memorize the order of things, it's not hard to do them in a row really fast. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you write with varied enough, like syllables and with simple enough syllables, then you can maintain like pretty easy fast rapping um Mm. for like long periods of time and then you like you can you can obviously rap more difficult things fast it just takes more practice um but like yeah it's it's just a matter of lining things up in these cases and so yeah it's like doing that intelligently like a big part of that is knowing that like just 
the difficulty of syllables, like which mm. ones are, are harder to say, which ones are harder to say, like in a row with other ones. Um, and you know, I, I, I find myself like thinking about this, um, like kind of like the difficulty and how a word feels and how it, how it, uh, it lands, like how, how we talked about like, okay, Google and, um, Alexa, you know, like how it does have kind of like a, um, a wave to it. Um, I find myself really focusing on that when I make up names for characters. Sometimes if it's like a clunky character, I'll come up with like a clunky name for them. Mm -hmm. And then um, if like it's a beautiful character, a really smooth character, like I'll come up with like a smooth sounding feeling name for them. Yeah. Um, but uh, it would be an interesting practice to write tonally or it is it, it, it i i know i've i've done this before just just switching from um writing lyrically to writing um uh like like noveling and stuff like that um mm -hmm. uh, i'll find myself clicking into that but to be very intentional about say if there's a if there's a difficult scene or an uncomfortable scene to choose your words in difficult like word like to choose difficult mm. words to pepper in there yeah. and then uh and then like say the release of that scene you break into all smooth words i wonder like if that would if that would impact or if it would just confuse or uh i wonder if, if that would play well with kind of like a subconscious immersion yeah. to the scene yeah it's really interesting it it reminds me of something that I heard of um, back in Hebrew school, back in uh, like junior high or high school. Um, we were learning about the Hebrew Bible. And at one point, my teacher told us that in the book of Hebrews, in the original language, I think it was probably written in Hebrew, but I don't remember. I think it, I think that's what it was. And I can, can't confirm if this was true. This was just what I was told um, by a teacher in this one random context. But it was that the grammar in the original translation like gets worse and it fluctuates at times when the story becomes more chaotic and it's harder to understand what's going on. They actually use grammar as a dimension to oh, like cool. they like make they have narrative with like bad grammar and things that don't make sense when it starts to become less like the society makes less and less sense it's like delves into like a sort of like madness script wow and i th thought that was like the coolest thing that is so cool like what yeah. a mechanism yeah you think about a, a a just another tool that you could wield in crafting tone right uh, for your it's story like, or not message. like a character losing their mind or like a like an unreliable narrator it's just like the grammar of all the narration of like just the page itself is just like i don't know it's like form. it's like messing with the form in such a deep way it reminds me of like something like house of leaves it's almost more like typography horror than a book mm. it's just like the words are just like placed on the page in weird places and like it, but like it's yeah it's just super fundamental and and yeah like like it just reminded me of what you were saying before of, yeah yeah that's so cool and that's i mean god like the uh studying hebrew like learning about the like we talked about it before the chiasm and just different literary devices to draw the reader in um a lot of them you have to hear them in the in the language that it's that it's spoken in to get to pick up on, uh, on these little Easter eggs and these, like these feelings and everything certainly lost in translation. <laughs> um, but, uh, going back to when, if, if you could read, that was a big deal. And then if you had access to books or scrolls, that was a big deal too. So most of this stuff was written to be orated and passed down through 
through cultures. So like almost through performances and storytelling. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you think about somebody who fully relies on, on that and like gets excited to hear this story, this history or something. And they go into you're listening. And then like all of a sudden the words that you're getting are like, are like a little hard to grasp and everything. So it would, it would put you there, you know, it's mm-hmm. almost like a, it's almost like a, like a, like a, uh, like a theater performance, but just with words. Mm-hmm. It's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. And I have another question about vocab. Let's go. Do you have a favorite word or any favorite words? I have. Um, oh, man. I wish I had thought about this before. Off the top of my head. Um I love I love the word sanguine. That's a good one. Uh sanguine is is great and then like uh exsanguinate <laughs> I think mm-hmm. is a, an awesome uh way to transform that into meaning something just crazy. <laughs> <laughs> uh and uh, let's see what's another one. Um uh, what about you? Um, there's different philosophies of ones. Like I've, I've liked a lot of words that are like, I, I love that word. And it's like about like the sound and the way it looks and like, like the word soliloquy. Soliloquy is great. It it had that ending in Q U Y. I just always really loved, like, it felt like how that makes sense, but no word does it. And it just like Mm -hmm. kind of feels good to my mouth to imagine it that way. So there's ones like that, but I think as I wrote more throughout life, like the words that became really valuable to me were more simple ones, but ones that are like highly visual, like words that really serve a purpose. And for me in storytelling, like what I'm always trying to do is like every sentence, I'm trying to capture some specific image or vision of what I see in my head. I'm like, I wonder, how do you describe a knife going in like that? Cause it's mm-hmm. like, it's going in in a specific way. Mm-hmm. And if I can get that visual across, it'll be really cool. And so, like, I look for little words that really, like, capture a lot with just, or, like, capture a specific way of saying something. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, like, they're sometimes more utility, but, like, like the word um, barrage, it, it feels like what it is. Like, you don't, there's less of, like, a, it, it is visual to me. Like, it, it's, like it feels like a barrage. It's just like yeah. what it says. <laughs> it's just like, it feels like a lot of things hitting in a row. Yeah. And I don't know exactly why, but it's just like a very good word for like describing that. It's like, it's active. It like has like energy to it. You know, another one that comes to mind when you say that is the word loathe. Mm. Like, yeah. man, I don't like that guy. I hate that guy. I loathe that guy, mm-hmm. you know, like, yeah. it's like with everything in your being, you mm-hmm. like despise, you know, it's like, yeah. low and it's feel you know? specific. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, that I, I certainly have, I certainly have words that I, that I get excited about or I'll think about it and then I'll, I'll be like, oh, I need to fluff this scene up to like, just really bring some punch to this one. Um, but I'm constantly thinking about that. I'm constantly thinking about like the tone of a word, the feel of a word, um, trying to push past just, you know, like, like taking, finding the, the articulating the, the definite exact definition of what you want to say in a word, like finding the word that fits, like its definition is like perfect for it is Mm -hmm. one thing. And I got carried away with that for a while in my writing. And, now I've found myself like wanting more feel and wanting it to read like when it reads and it just feels like dripping with with uh with tone like that's what I want more uh than and I've started to sacrifice sometimes and I've started to bend definitions a little bit and fit words in to make a sentence or a paragraph hit the tone more than just like this one word hit the tone Mm -hmm. you know what I mean yeah. Um, 
I I really enjoy that in 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 writers. Uh, wait, wait, which aspect of it? Sorry. Well, picking up on that on other writers, you know. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. And we've talked we've talked about that kind of tone thing, like that. It's a very like poish thing to do, where you know, it's just it's the whole thing's got a tone to it. Yeah. Not that he's using a ton of like crazy big words or perfect words for it, mm-hmm. but they're all the same. Like, right. It's color. consistent. Yeah. 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 I love Ed Carlin Poe, dude. Yeah, me too. And you showed me HP Lovecraft a few yes. episodes ago. That was so cool. Like he's, he is such like a great extension of the same. Yeah. He's a super yeah. fan. Yeah. A super fan, but from the forties. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Wild. Well, taking a step further in vocab, um, I wanted to share uh, uh, some things about good old William Shakespeare. Yes, uh, father of vocabulary. <laughs> yeah. So this dude, um, I know. I, I, I it's, uh, it's, it's a fun fact to to share here and there about like you know different words that uh, or that different words that Shakespeare has invented, but the sheer like breadth of of what he did what 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 he brought to our culture is is mind-blowing he created 1700 words that's crazy 1700 1700 words i don't know if i know that many words i don't know either and he those are words that he made (laughs) up have you Um, ever have you ever counted that high not just sitting there. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> Although, sidebar, you can Google or you can look up on YouTube people counting to a million. And they'll just like, they'll just get on and be like, all right, I'm going from 567,000 to 500. Do you think there's any count? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because it takes them like years. Okay. Um, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a fun one. Um, if you're looking to kill some time, but like, like just, uh, just to throw some out there, aerial amazement, uh, apostrophe, assassination, uh, bloody bump. Um, let's see. <laughs> countless courtship, critic, critical, wait, wait, yeah, wait, dexterously, what bloody, what bloody was blood before this, <laughs> like... bloody, like you yeah. know, like he, he, yeah, he yeah. was like the first to add, and I and you know you don't know if he was the first, but this is the first time that it was recorded, written down. Sure. Maybe people were saying this in culture. Oh, okay. it was the first time it was used. Well, that and that one, I feel like is a big part of British slang. Yeah, where, where they they may even mean it in a very particular way in this list. This is the first time it was ever recorded. That's wild. It's never shown up on. But like, I wonder. I I wonder if I wonder if they mean specifically as an exclamation. I don't know. Or like a. But the list goes on. Lonely. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) Lonely. Laughable. Uh, Hurry. Generous. Frugal. uh, Disheartened. Eventful. Obscene, majestic, misplaced, monumental, uh, multitudinous, <laughs> pious. That was a crazy one. Road. 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 <laughs> what? R O A D. Good to know that we would just have nothing without him. God, submerge. Like, what the hell? Ambulance. Uh, like, the. The it, it it blows my well actually I don't know if ambulance was I know it's ambulance is straight Latin, um, that wasn't on this list that that was just one that I was told once uh, but uh, and then like going on from that you talk about uh, different phrases the first time that these phrases ever showed up were in his plays uh, like uh, all that all that all that glistens is not gold. Uh, Break the ice, clothes make the man. Um, come what may, devil incarnate, uh, eating me out of house and home, a laughing stock in a pickle, 
It's Greek to me. Pound of flesh. Uh, such stuff as dreams are made on. Uh, <laughs> dude, like too much of a good thing. Wear one's heart on one's sleeve. Wild goose chase. What's done is done. <laughs> All these things. Like we still use them. Like they're still so current. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, it was never a thing until this dude did it. Um, which, I mean, there are... What do you think about the theories about uh, Shakespeare? I don't know enough. I mean, I feel like it's... I, f I feel like from what I've heard, the theories that he's not real are, like, bogus. But I don't know. I, I have no I clue. <laughs> I don't know. Like, I... Me too. But then, like, then, like, in looking at some of this, like, the sheer, like, scope of his, the 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 breadth of his work and mm -hmm. and like the impact that it had on culture for some reason like it makes it unbelievable that you're like yeah this is one dude mm. um, but i kind of like buy like a prolific guy <laughs> like like 1700 words is a lot but like couldn't you just unlock your brain to a point where you're just like coming up with them like, I feel like yeah. he was just, like, every day, he was just like, yeah, there's another thing that needs, like, a name for it. Like, and you can get yourself into a groove. And he's, like, he was in the groove for a long time. Like, That's true. Like, and undistracted from the groove. And praised for being in the groove. Like, yeah. Yeah. I said that. I could, okay, I could see that. Right. And it's just hard for my distracted brain to wrap my mind around. <laughs> like, like, I think... I, yeah, I guess that's like, I think if you were put in a position that he was, you would be able to do it. Like, like if you were just like, yeah, no other distractions, this is your life. Mm -hmm. um, and you are recognized for how great you are at this. Like you would, you would have a word a day, I think. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, I don't know. Like he, Especially he obviously was. Especially if the pool was, is so thin, you're just kind of maybe one of the first one of the first to like kind of have that enlightening moment of like, Oh, the, we could push past this veil of these yeah. are the only words we can use. I'm just yeah. going to do it. Oh, it worked. I'm going to keep doing it. Uh huh. Yeah. And I'm, he did. It's crazy. Wait. So how many plays did he write as well? Um, let's see. That's worth a good Google. Let's see how many plays. Because we're going to figure it out. On By the end of this podcast, we're going to have a definitive answer. Was Shakespeare real or fake? Right. We're going to hear our heads 38 together. 38 plays and over 150 <laughs> short and long poems. Sounds suspect. Think about Brandon Sanderson. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> like, Wait, I swear. Sounds, sus sounds suspicious, I mean. Another word that he created. <laughs> <laughs> it's just impossible to insult him because you have to use words that he what created to insult him. <laughs> um, <laughs> but like, way That's of true. kings, way of kings through oath break, oathbringer is like as much content as all Shakespeare's plays, right? Probably, honestly. I, don't, <laughs> I mean, well, thirty-eight. If they're they're obviously they're all they they're all separate stories with like a package and like a meaning and like a theme, and that's like that's like noteworthy to be able to do that beyond writing three massive epics with like tangling kind of stories that only converge once every book or whatever. Mm. Like it, it definitely is a different task, but like. I think when you look at like what people are capable of doing if they have the time, attention and like belief in themselves, like like Sanderson I I think that the way that we see any like human kind of sport even like evolve over time, like runners consistently getting faster like year mm -hmm. after year, it's like more the human spirit knowing what it's capable of, I think than any actual like Oh, our genetics are getting better over time. It's like, I think maybe like there's like training practices are getting better. Like practices of like knowing how to perform the craft are getting better. Same with writing. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but then also, 
uh, the human spirit is knows that it's capable of more. And it's like Sanderson knows that we can write these crazy epics. You know, he's seen Lord of the Rings. He's seen Game of Thrones. He's seen himself do all these like stories before. And it's like none of those things existed in Shakespeare's time. It's like mm-hmm. he was putting together the, the foundations for like Hamlet is the foundation for much of fantasy to come after it. Right. So like he had no, nothing to base his whole. Mm hmm perspective on obviously that's how you trace intellectual heritage through the classics and that's why we love and respect them uh i do you think that uh we are do you think it's a balance of like access as you're talking about like access and understanding of what's capable and uh and growth as um in like human possibility understanding of that. Um, do you think there's a balance of also distractions though? Like, like how easily it is to be distracted today and how many things are constantly pulling on your focus. Uh, like, whereas, you know, I think back to, and and maybe it's all relative, but you know, I think back to like Shakespearean times, I feel like I just feel like there would be less distractions back then. Yeah. And... Think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Like where are there less distractions when you're worried about putting like a shelter over your head? <laughs> like every other, like, Oh, the winter months are coming. Will we survive the cold? Like that's okay. a pretty big fucking distraction. <laughs> okay, okay. Okay. Break down, <laughs> break down the Maslow's prior hierarchy of needs. I don't know yeah so like there's basic human needs like shelter food water that's like at the bottom tier but then like yeah. you get the next tier we have like um like social needs right mm. and like the need to be like accepted in a community and then the need to be liked and then like the need to have like a role the need to be like fulfilling something of your own then self-actualization is like the highest tier um Ah. so there's like it's i mean there's obviously way more specifics to it this is like that's the most basic dumbass version but like you 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 those people like you may think of it as like a simpler life simpler way of living but like they don't even have the foundations of all their basic resources taken care of to be able to free their minds to think about like creativity at all that's true okay touche yeah, so I think in that way, there's probably fewer distractions. But, <laughs> but at the same time, we do have, I think, a ton of distractions on top of that that are like... like the birth of advertising on right. mass scale. Right. Uh, like Targeted we, advertisings. Yeah, and we are in, you know, like some pretty serious like systems of like capitalism and big business and advertising that are like trying to very much i think keep us within certain like perspectives and certain ways of seeing things and so that is like a whole a method of like probably mass media brainwashing that was not like possible or affecting people's lives in the same way right. hundreds of years ago but yeah the, the only you know, way they were it. doing it back then was at a play that shakespeare wrote <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh man well, um, so I feel like we should we should keep bumping along. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, do you want? So, speaking of vocabulary and uh, uh, and and wordsmithing, which is what we're specifically talking about today, and making the creation of words, and uh, I I thought it'd be a great idea to do a lyrical deep dive on a song called In Seekers, which. Uh, in seekers is a made up word. Um, and, but although it's, it's super simple and it, it's kind of, I guess it could be hyphenated. Um, but, but it's, it's like, not. Eh, but, but I didn't hyphenate it. Uh, so I thought we could dive in there and do a little lyrical deep dive on, uh, on that song. Yeah. Let's do it. Um, do you want me to read through the lyrics or would you like to? uh let's see so why don't you why don't you read through the lyrics uh and just kind of give me a little just stop when you want to and i'll tell you what it's, where we're at all right it starts out with the chorus uh 
Pry your eyes and behold our captain, rally round his feet. As he controls his captive, bring him to his knees. I said, behold our captain, rally round his feet, calling the bold to stand and make the coward bleed. Yes. Okay, so place of this is, this is the first song in Children of Fire, um, which is a continuation from Son of the Morning. Uh, and Son of the Morning document, or it was... Uh, depicting uh, basically setting up for the battle between uh, the God and the devil. And um, at the end of children of fire or of son of the morning, uh, God's final response is, is the finisher where uh, he basically lays out that I'm going to cut off your horns. And, you know, I, I wrote your history I'm, and I'm writing you an end to you. And, in seekers picks up uh basically in that battle in the battle that was being talked about and uh and that would that was being set up and it is uh kind of picking up as like from the perspective of of uh, the boots on the ground like this is an actual battle happening on earth in front of us and we can see it and this is this is God and and, and devil battling, and so it, it it's coming from the perspective on, of someone on on God's side, and he's just like kind of a Riley cry, like behold, uh, prior eyes and behold our captain rally around his feet uh, uh, as he controls his captive, uh, bring him to his knees. You know, it's just kind of like a like 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 they're cheering on the fight type thing, and uh, and. And a rally cry to 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 support to support him in that battle, and so that's where we're at right now. All right, so we go from there. Strain your cords, push this chant through the discord. Lift your gall to an end seeking valor, bread to abound. Through the years, our beating pulses stood contending. The skins they indwell. Yes. I love this verse. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so. It's a battlefield, and uh, it uh, and also this is I, I'm kind of explaining at the um, at the surface metaphor of, of of this of what it what what's actually like being described. Okay. Um, strain your cords, push this chant through <clears throat> Discord. Uh, is like it's metaphorical of you know, of the surface, which would be they're on this battlefield and it's super loud and everything like that. And strain your cords, like, like yell as loud as you can, like, like, like bring the rally cry, uh, yell loud, like, like bring it above, uh, of, above the discord, above the, the, the clamor, the cacophony that's going on. But, uh, within, uh, within deeper within the metaphor, it's talking about the, basically the battle, um, of, of being human against flesh and against uh, basically spirit and world and and all of that, like 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 basically everything pulling you away or pulling you, uh, trying to uh, either bit like suffocate your voice, um, it's it's strain your cords, like 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 do anything you can to uh, to push this chant through the discord. Like we have to do this together. We that we have to uh, we have to believe and uh, lift your gall to an in seeking valor, uh, and you know that meaning just um, bring uh, like you're setting your sights. Like like that's that's we're we're bringing it into this thing. Like this isn't mm -hmm. just for a win. This is this is for the win. Like this is a once and for all, like lift your gall to that. Like we'll take no nothing else. Uh, we're bred to abound through the years. Our beating pulses stood contending the skins they indwell. And that's again, the war against uh, heart and uh, I guess heart and mind or uh, the soul and flesh uh, basically born to do this, you know, like we're born uh, between made between angels and animals not fully spiritual not fully carnal something in between 
that has to skirt this line. Like we're born for this battle. Mm-hmm. Um, and okay. And that kind of wraps. Yeah. Up and that. so then the, through the years are beating pulses through contending the skin saying dwell. It's just like talking about the enemy that they're fighting. Right. Well, we're bred right. to abound through the years. Our beating pulses, uh, yeah. Stood contending the skins that they dwell. So like, we're, like we're we're bred to to win this like it's been written like we're we're here to beat this Mm -hmm. through through all of these years that we've been here like this is the moment you know this is like end seekers like here and in the definition of the song would you define that more as like seeking the end of this trial or is it like seeking the end like ready to die it's it's like final victory. Um, so like, it's like, like seeking like, the like, end to all the striving and like the war. It's like seeking yeah, the end yeah. of the battle. As I I always un- sort of understood it, the word as like ready to die. It it is. It, it could it could be seen as that like the um the end. You know you you talk about like the the battle between good and evil. Like this is mm-hmm. the end of it. Yeah. Like it's yeah. No, it's ending. awesome. Like this is. Uh, I'm glad to have no brought one. in my perspective on it. Yeah, yeah, it. yeah. But willing to die for it, like, like willing to uh, do anything, like bread to a to a bound, like, uh, like you are. Yeah, we're we're rushing into the battlefield because this is the end. This yeah. is this is the final battle where, like, where evil is conquered. Yeah. And then we go into the chorus again, right? Uh, which repeats. And then, then it comes out to, so long, all you children, don't go. We're almost there. Your road is not yet coming to an end. What do my eyes perceive? So contrary to the promise that secured us, now you're nowhere to be found. You can't just up and leave. Abandonment is the thumbprint of that cur who just hit the ground. You lead us straight to hell. Yes, and here is the twist. Um, so, uh. This sets the tone for uh, what the entire album is about. And um, the concept for the album came to me. Uh, I wanted to, with, with just an idea of what if, what if we as a people saw God and the devil in real life, like everyone on earth saw it. It was like, oh my God, they're, they are real. And they battled. And what if they both died in front of our eyes? What if they, what if this, what if they like defeated each other and they both just disappeared in front of our eyes? But everyone saw it. It's un, it's undeniable. So like what, what would happen? And so that like, like this, like that was the tone of this, this, and I wanted to, to I wanted that to be the the landscape, and then I wanted to create characters that existed in that landscape, and like looked around at what they saw in this kind of like spiritual dystopia, um, and you know that what what happens in a world where there there is no uh, reward of heaven, no fear of hell, with nothing like that motivating your your decisions, like how many of the good people would still be good? How many of the bad people would still be bad? How many, you know, what, Mm. what would really come out then? Yeah. Um, and so this is, this is in in seekers, uh, setting the tone for that. You know, it starts out in this valiant charge and it's like, yeah, we got this. We got this. It's like coming from like eyes on the ground. Like this is what we're made for. This is the end. This is like victory is Mm. in sight. Give it everything we got. Behold our captain. And then God says, God sings out so long, all you children. And then the cry back from that, the response from that is the, the boots on the ground, like me on the ground, like, don't go. We're almost there. Mm -hmm. You know, this is, this is it. And then him saying, your road is not yet coming to an end. And it's like, wait, this isn't the end. Like, what do you mean? Uh, and then, and then it's like betrayal setting in, Mm -hmm. in, in, in kind of hysteria setting in of, what do my eyes perceive so contrary to the promise that secured us? The promise that secured us was that this was the battle, that the mm-hmm. finisher was true. 
and that yeah. this was the final battle and we knew what was going to happen. And that's why we're risking it all because we believe. And now we're perceiving something completely different. And then it's so contrary to the promise that secured us. Now you're nowhere to be found. Now our leader just disappeared. Yeah. Uh, you can't just up and leave. Abandonment is the thumbprint of that cur who just hit the ground. So like, like, uh, like basically like the devil, like, hits the ground and then they both disappear and it's like wait that's what he does he abandons not you like that this is wrong and then and then it's the it's just the the snap judgment you let us straight to hell this mm -hmm. is it true like abandon like they say you know one of the theories of hell is uh is that it's just um uh, that that hell is uh either abandonment of god or not knowing god or right. the um, absence of God, absence of God. Mm -hmm. And so you let us straight to hell. Yeah. Is now what is now what the troops are all thinking and screaming and, mm -hmm. and that leads us right into the, the bridge or the breakdown here. Yeah. Uh, this is hell. This is hell. Make my grave or animate my veins, make my grave or animate my veins. Yeah. So, now I'm in hell. Like, I don't know what's going on. I don't understand any of this. God, just kill me or give me a purpose or explain something mm -hmm. like do something. I don't know what to do because I, I, I got here following you. Now you, now you're gone or dead, or I don't know what you are. Like, I'd rather, I, I, I want death or answers. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, give me a path. What's it going to be? Yeah. Because uh, I don't have it on my own, I need I need you to animate my my veins. I love that part in the song. It's a cool part, especially with how like the rhythm goes. It like kind of switches back and forth. In, yeah, like, a weird like syncopated way. It's a really cool part. The snare starts hitting on a different part. Yeah, or the from the vocal. Mm -hmm. Um. All right. So then it goes into so long, all you children were the last words that you said and now my bones just keep bending to reach for an end you said brace yourself when the air grows thick and brace yourself when the world constricts and brace yourself for what will come next mm -hmm. and that is uh basically reflection of just this you know i pictured like i i i always have a visual in my mind of like the voice that I'm like, what are they seeing? What are they thinking? What are they like? What does it look like? What is, what is their mm -hmm. uh, peripheral look like? And I saw just like this, I don't know, maybe like a, almost like a Godzilla type thing, you know, Godzilla King Kong type thing, but like in this like ruined city or, or like, or just uh barren wasteland of like this sea of people, like around these two giant contenders or whatever. And, uh, and then like, they're both gone and like, it's just, there's people flipping out in all different ways, handling it in all different ways. And it goes to this person who's been, who was the voice at the very beginning, um, just reflecting on what was said. And he's, he's like, so long, all you children were the last words that you said. And now my bones just keep bending to reach for an end. Like I'm, I'm trying everything in me. My bones are bending to 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 make sense of this because it's the last thing I thought would ever ha you would ever do to me. Uh, you said, "Brace yourself when the air grows thick. Brace yourself when the, when the world constricts, um, and brace yourself for what will come next." Like uh, that was the you know basically like the teachings growing up or teachings growing up and like getting to this point point like. Just brace yourself when it gets tough. You know, brace yourself when the world turns against you. Mm -hmm. And now you're saying, brace yourself for what will come next. But you just turned against us. And that was the thing. Like, so it, it's just this confusion of this. And I, I just pictured this guy just standing there, like, with, like, sword or whatever, whatever, whatever armor or whatever he was bringing to the fight. And it's just like, he, they're just slunk down. He's maybe he's dropped them, and he's just kind of staring at his hands or his feet or something. He's looking around at this mass chaos, and uh, and he's just going through his head like what? It, he's kind of in shock. Mm -hmm. 
That's and then awesome. uh and then we go into just the the chorus one yeah. more time but that is to that's to set the tone in seekers is to set the tone of of the of the story to come so it's that a is very boom. epic intro <laughs> <laughs> and so now I know what end seekers really means. Once yeah. you seek the end of the of the great war, or yes. the end of the all the calamities. Yeah, yeah. It, it like to. I've kind of, I've kind of used it, uh, carried it around as like a focus. Like I'm not just here for small victories like i want to win the war mm. i'm an sure. end seeker yeah 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 and you're not like you're not just here to prolong the fighting or like to right like, create more violence it's just like we're seeking right it, it's like a stance of purpose yeah and uh an in seeker in my mind is someone who's not even so concerned about like winning the war of their life but the the big picture type thing you know like the end is such a massive word you know like that's the the end is is at the end of all all like stories you know you get to this like the end like it's so and so uh i just that that's one of those words that has like weight to it you know end mm -hmm. i will end you you know like your end <laughs> You mm -hmm. met your end is there's nothing after the end. There never is. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, like, uh, like a, one who seeks the end of the war, not just the battle. Yeah. That's awesome. It's an awesome song. Awesome word. Sick imagery. Really cool place to leave us on the, on the story with the intro there big fan yeah thanks man and the, ne the next song shed your soul is absolute uh like mayhem and anarchy <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah okay and that wraps it up that's that's yeah. new seekers bio sleeper and so i guess from here will we go into the interview yeah let's hop into that interview all right, guys. Enjoy uh, meeting our friend Brian McNeil. We think you yes. really like this interview here. Absolutely. All right, here we go. Oh, here we go. Wait. Boop boop. What's up, Brian? Hey, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> welcome to the bar. Nice. <laughs> yeah, man. Can we get you a drink? What 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 are you having, man? What uh, what digital <laughs> beverage are you having? A wild. A uh, black cherry margarita last night that was pretty good. So. A black cherry margarita? That sounds delicious. Literally at a restaurant called Margaritas and stuff. <laughs> okay. So did They've they, got to do it well. Yeah. Okay. How'd they do with the black cherry? I had two. So, I mean. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. Nice, man. Well, thank you so much for being on here, man. It's so glad to uh, to finally put a face with the name. I've seen your face, so I can't say the same, but thanks. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's been awesome having your stories in for the five weeks and the other ones as well. I mean, you've submitted beyond those too. Um, it's been great to have you as a part of the community. Absolutely. So got, we got some questions. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we'll, uh, we'll start out with how did you get into writing? Um, I don't even know that it was like technically – like a specific thing. I just kind of started doing it. Um, the first time I can remember like actually writing was probably like mid to later high school. Um, my dad got me into Lord of the Rings. Um, so I read that like four times. <laughs> um, nice. And, you know, I did my like little weird teenager thing where I'm like, I'm going to write my own version of this, like, you know, like big epic fantasy novel. And, you know, it never went anywhere, obviously. But um, it was just something I was like, oh, this is interesting. Like, you know, let me see what I can do with this. Um, honestly, it was never something I did a lot of. Um, and I still don't do it a ton. Honestly, this is probably the most I've ever written, um, just having the challenges and stuff like that. So I never really took any kind of courses or classes about it or like, learned you know or anything i just kind of did my own thing um you know so like honestly right now the majority of why i write is uh mental health <laughs> um it is a way for me to kind of get my 
thoughts and feelings out there when I feel like I can't, you know, verbally articulate. Um, and I think it's actually been good for the people in my life that, you know, may not understand uh, what's going on in my head. Um, so it's a little easier for me to use those as a way to either express what's going on with me or just, you know, my feelings towards the people in my life or just as a way to kind of, you know, get things out or whatever. Um, and then yeah. I, occasionally I'll do, you know, like somewhat of a story. Um, I'm, I kind of tend to have the habit of like starting something and being all excited about it and then, you know, ADHD. <laughs> um, and then I just stopped doing it. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's one of those things where, like I kind of have to be like, you know, in the mood. Um, and then sometimes I just kind of come back to it, but at the same time, it's always something I enjoy. And um, it's probably the one thing in my life that I can look at now and say, oh, I'm good at that. Um, Cause my whole life I've kind of not thought I was good at anything. Um, and it's the one thing where like, without me seeking the approval from other people to tell me that I was like, oh, you're good at this. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's nice to personally feel something, that you're good at something outside of Oh yeah, absolutely, man. Yeah. What a, when you uh talking about like kind of venting and expressing um with with mental health uh with the mental health journey. Um whenever you uh apply that in your story writing, do you find that you apply that to where you kind of pick a character and you vent through that character or do you find that you you vent through all of your characters and kind of make the whole situation feel like uh, what you're feeling? Um, it kind of depends. Honestly, I don't do a lot of story work. Um, most of the stuff I've done story-wise was for right guys. Um, I'm more of a poetry guy. Um, I did write a, the be again, a, the beginnings of a story years ago. Um, and it was kind of like a parallel to me and people in my life. Um, I don't know if you know him, Michael, but I know Ben knows my friend John. Um, we were like he he kind of and I were kind of co I don't know, like we weren't he wasn't like writing any aspect of it, but you know, he was just talking about certain aspects. And I remember specifically at that point, like so I sorry, a little backstory. Um, like seven years ago I deconstructed from Christianity, but before that I was like very, very into the church and stuff like that. So like I was writing a book that was kind of a mixture of, you know, Christian characters, but they suffered from like severe mental health. Um, like mostly the main character, um, which was based off of me. Um, and just kind of addressing that and not shying away from the fact that, you know, this is actually stuff that happens. Um, mm. And then I kind of progressed um, where I do you know, tend to take aspects of myself. Sometimes I put them in stories, like when I wrote my, uh, like that was like the three challenge thing where like we started with one, yeah. like that one, you know, obviously gay characters. Um, you know, so that was something that was like, okay, cool. Um, you know, I'll, I'll use that. And like, cause to me that's normal. Um, you know, mm -hmm. and a lot of times it's not something that is necessarily put into writing. So I, was, I like to write what I'm, getting more comfortable with and like stuff like that so yeah i loved that story by the way and it, it was yeah. so beautifully done and and i loved uh, the perspective of battle brothers you know like it's it, the ever since learning that uh that alexander the great would pair battle brothers up it would be uh there would be homosexual couples that and they would put them together as, as shield mates because no one would would look after you better than the one you love and yeah, that was like <clears throat> he Sparta conquered the was, world with it. Like, Sparta was defeated by an army of like gay soldiers. Really, gay lovers. Yeah, I didn't yeah. know that. What mm -hmm. do you know? What army that was? Or I what, believe it was what? the Theban army. Oh wow! -E I didn't realize that. And... That's powerful. Yeah. But that was the first time I'd ever read a story from yeah. that perspective. It was awesome, man. Part of the the podcast where you talked about that, and like weirdly enough, I forget where I heard it, but like shortly thereafter, I. Some, like some show or something I was like oh yeah this stuff, like he did this and i was like what <laughs> i was like i've never <laughs> until mike said it and now i've heard it again <laughs> <laughs> fact checked right <laughs> i was like oh that's real <laughs> yeah can we pause i yes I turn my ac off thank you ben <laughs> every time every time you talk it prioritizes your uh your 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 volume 
And every time you stop, his AC comes back on like. <laughs> so now he's starting the timer on his his room turning into an oven. So yeah, <laughs> I'm hoping mine wasn't too. I don't know if mine's too loud on your end, but mm. I can't live without my air conditioning. <laughs> no, no you're, can't good, hear you're good. It, you're good. All right. Uh, yeah, one more one more question on uh, on. Uh, that on on that particular question you said that uh you got into lord of the rings early yeah uh whenever you were um like or, or, or who who ended up being kind of your favorite character in lord of the rings uh, i think gandalf probably like i don't know why uh i mean honestly i think about it now it's probably more so because he was sort of kind of like the fatherly figure and uh i didn't have the greatest father figure mm -hmm. um you know outside of him being like, hey, we go to the ranks. Like, that was a, a good thing. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. I just, always, I've always liked his character. I really love the Abel Callan in the movies. And, you know, it just kind of, you know, personified the literary role. Um, yeah. I don't know. Just like the whole leading everybody, accepting people, understanding their problems, and, you know, magic and all that shit. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I you see, I have a, a sword behind me on the wall here. Oh. Yes. Enduril. <laughs> oh, there she is. <laughs> oh, it's beautiful. I've got Sting in my room somewhere. I have to dig him up though. Uh, I got it for my uh, for my birthday from my I buddy can't James. Find this place that it's like four and a half feet long. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's awesome, man. Well, Ben, you want to take the next question? Yes, sir. Um, Brian, do you have any? projects that you're currently working on any writing projects uh, similar i uh i tend to get sidetracked but i do want to move back to it uh the story that i asked you for a prompt for is kind of what i'm working on um it has the i don't know what you would call the word um the elements i guess to become something pretty big um i'm not entirely sure if i will get very far with it but uh it is fun to write um I very much enjoy trying to write in a way that makes you visualize things um, pretty clearly um, without going into like ridiculous detail. Um, but I kind of like when I write, I feel like part of my process is just like I imagine what I'm thinking in my mind and then how would I, you know, write that out and, yeah. like, you know, conveys that. Yeah, that um, totally often, conveys like the physics yeah. of exactly what's going on in your Without head. Without trying to like use normal words or like common things, like I try to explain it in a almost poetic kind of way, but like at the same time, like you know, I just I try not to stay in the realm of like boring words, like just everyday things. I try to use like I remember <laughs> when you guys were talking about um, Hune when I Hune. did my oh poetry. so <laughs> good. <laughs> When I read the Lord of the Rings, like it's he used it so many times that when he talks about like you know in the minds of Warrior when like the rocks are hewn with like slashes from my weapons and stuff, and I just that's not a word that you hear very much, mm -hmm. but it's like one of those things where like I'll use that and be like, yeah, that's a good one. Like uh, you know, outside yeah. of just, like, oh, there was a cut in the tree, you know, or something like that. You can use yeah. a word that conveys it and just it sounds cooler. <laughs> it's so much more colorful. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. What uh so you you said that uh, a prompt that that uh, Ben yeah, gave right. you? Um so I was like in the mood and I said can you give me a prompt uh for something to write and he said an epic horror fantasy told in the third person. <laughs> the second person I think, right? He's the third cuz that's person. How yeah. Okay. But uh yeah, so I'm like two and a half chapters I guess. Oh, uh nice. Just kind of start out in the middle of nowhere so it's a lot of I'm my other big thing too is like I try, I, I kind of don't steer away from like adult aspects of things. Like there's cursing, um, yeah, kind of stuff. Like there's yeah, <laughs> um, that kind of thing. Um, I, when I was writing my previous story, the one I was saying about with my friend John, um, I think you both know Sky, or at least I know Ben does. Mm -hmm. um, he, he jokingly was like, "Where's the alien sex scene?" And I, and I was like, "You know what? I think I'll write that for you." Like, you know, like, clearly, you know, stories should involve some kind of weird erotica. But um, right, yeah, that so, like, seems I, to be I, Sky's I, I, mo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so 
I was like, you know what? That's not something that I should, uh, you know, think is taboo or something like that. Like, I just feel like writing is writing. It can be about whatever. And if you don't want to read it, then don't read it. But um, yeah, so I mean, I, I definitely get colorful with language and material and stuff like that. Um, you know, and I think it's weird too because like it is so socially acceptable to not do that as much. Um, when I reread my stuff, I'm like, oh, like, did I really want to put that in there? Isn't that weird? <laughs> Part of me still makes me uncomfortable, but I'm like, no. <laughs> you know, like yeah. That's, it is what it is. Like, like even when I did the the, the lover uh, story, like you know, adding the like saying cunt and like the <laughs> their thoughts and stuff like that, I was just like, you know what? It adds to it. Like, what would you actually say in real life? Not just yeah. like. Oh, this girl like you know like yeah it, yeah. it does it really does like it makes it more immersive and you're yeah. not you didn't do it gratuitously yeah you did it very like like it makes sense like they, like this is in battle this is like this is uh the drama is high you know yeah. like i i, I agree 100 percent that it's uh something i've wrestled with for a while but i'm i'm, I'm starting to like break off the latches uh that i've been locking my my censorship all over my writing for a long time. Um, uh, and, uh, and it's nice to be able to express it, but there is always that whenever I'm reading over, I'm like, Ugh. yeah. Uh, but just like you said it, like read it or don't like, I'm not forcing you to read this, but I am expressing myself and, oh. and I'm going to do it how I want to. Yeah. Very cool. Brian, so, Oh, how would you say that right guys has helped you? Um, honestly, it's like, and I feel like it's probably the answer everyone says, but like consistency, um, it's, I, I look forward to a challenge every week. Um, obviously there's a couple that I haven't done, um, but I do like changing it up as opposed to just, you know, cause like typically my type is I'll just be like, Oh, I, I'll randomly feel like writing a poem and I'll write a poem. Um, but it's nice to kind of you know, spread my wings as it were. And do different styles, um, you know, topics, that kind of thing. And like, again, because I never really made it like an even a remotely regular thing. So it's nice to have, you know, oh, here's this thing. Why don't you do that? I'm like, you know what? Okay. You know, and it makes me set aside the time to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. honestly, like, you know, a little, you know, ego, like it's nice to hear you guys read the stories and have feedback. Like, cause you know, I don't usually share anything outside of like my friends. You know, so it's cool to have, you know, that. And then you read it and you're like, oh, yeah, like, cool. I'm on a podcast, you know? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Awesome. I'm so glad to hear that, man. That it, it's, it's, it's a, it's a joy to, to get to read your stuff. I'm so glad that, that you're a part of the community. Do you have any pieces that you would like to share? Uh, sure. Um, so kind of back to what I said about me writing land of feelings, that kind of thing. I have one about that, which I wrote semi recently um and if it's cool to read too um i have one i wrote about my best friend um which again like i like being able to use my writing as a way to say what i can't always verbally articulate um but then doing it in like a artsy fartsy way um <laughs> so awesome. i wanted him to know how i felt you know so i wrote that for him and then the other thing was just a way for me to kind of unload my where my brain was at, um, how I was feeling. Um, the thing I like about this one is, uh, you know, it expresses the fact that I'm dealing with a lot, um, but I can still see, you know, in the outskirts of my bullshit that's going on that I have people in my life that are there for me. Um, mm -hmm. So I'll read that one first. It's called When I Can No Longer Be Me. Um, and I hate reading my own stuff, so like I tend to be kind of monotone. Okay. In this it's okay. so Everybody does. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, darkness like a tomb, embraced by rot and shadow. Soft fingers in the pitch, pulling me into safety. Horrors and evil abound, consumed by dread at all times. Calm whispers speak hope, true words of healing. All feeling is lost, thrown in a heap down a well. Tight arms embracing, pull it back from the depths. Alone in a thick wood, directions all the same. Listening ears hear my cries, then turn them to laughter. Silence amidst the chaos, uneasy calm before disaster. I feel and hear nothing. Looking in their eyes, I see nothing. Where are those fingers, the whispers, the arms? 
Do you hear me, ears? I'm drowned out by the silence. My screams come out blank. No rest for me, for I am wicked. I'm punished for all the good deeds. This nice guy will finish last, but the race never ends. Find me in a pile on the floor. Carry me from the eye of the storm. Wrap me in the love I don't deserve. Save me when I won't save myself. I may not want to know. I may want to stay lost on the floor. I just might like the dark, cold storm. And I've said I'm undeserving, but I know you'll save me anyway. I'm something to you, worthy in your eyes. You've seen what the storm has done, and you've emptied my floor before. I've been held like a child, put back together like a puzzle, kissed on the head through tears, pulled back from the abyss. I am not me without you. Not sure I could be without you. High above it all, above the black, your fire points me home. Mm. So, that was beautiful, man. Yeah. Um, really, so yeah. Thank you for that. Like, you know, I, I have depression, anxiety, um, borderline personality disorder, um, just a whole bunch of stuff that I'm trying to figure out, work through. Um, you know, so my my brain and my thoughts and stuff can get really dark. Um, I have shared some of this personally with them. Um, you know, so like I get in these head spaces and a lot of times I just feel like it to a degree, I feel better if I can just kind of put it out there. Um, it doesn't always have the, you know, glimmer of hope in there. Sometimes it's just straight up dark, um, which, you know, that's how life is sometimes. And um, But yeah, so I have a lot like that. Um, I do try to have like, you know, at least like the last verse or last line have some kind of like light at the end of the tunnel kind of thing. Um, but like I said, not always. Uh, but definitely has helped me. Um, yeah, so. mm. you, uh, find, you, you find that um, <clears throat> whenever you're, especially in those ones that are like, that don't really end with the happy ending, but they're just, it's just, it's just the feeling of, of the now, which may be yeah. very dark. You find that, you know, you always get to that point, you know, in with, with, with a piece where you write the final line, you're like, that's it. It's done. Do you find, um, that kind of cathartic uh whenever 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 you can read it over and be like that is exactly how i feel do you think it kind of puts some organization on your thoughts and um yeah to a degree i mean kind of like even the one part in that particular piece like i talk about how maybe i like the storm maybe i like you know yeah. talk about how like there are times where i get caught up in the feeling of like you know like i kind of enjoy being sad like do i really not want to be sad you know like to me, obviously, the answer is no, I don't. But there are times where I just get so used to it that it's like, well, why don't I just like drop into that and let it? Yeah. Know, work. Um, but yeah, I will say that like whenever I finish them, I definitely have like a like, okay, cool, I've gotten that out there. I will reread it like for editing purposes or just to kind of see where it went. Um, and if anything, it'll be like, all right, like like you said, like yeah, I that's how I feel and that's just the way it is. Um, but at the same time, it's, it is just helpful in the, like I said, to get it out, yeah. um, you know, to verbalize what's going on in my brain to some degree, because a lot of the time with the, what I'm experiencing, I can't say what I need to say. Like people will be like, Oh, what's going on? I'm like, ah, I don't know. Like, I, you know, I, literally, right. I can't articulate what is happening, you know, in a way that makes sense, you know? So like, I just do that and, you know, it, it does help, but it also there are times where it's like, yeah, that is how I feel. And it, it brings me to a point of being like, uh, again, like we feel like I just accept like that is how it is. And maybe it's not great, but it, at the same time, it gives me like a brief moment to kind of look back and be like, all right, well, you know, and typically they're all on my phone. So like <laughs> they're in a list. So like if there's like a, a positive one <laughs> nearby that I'm like, yeah, you know, like this proves that <laughs> there are, you know, not horrible days. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. it's, it's like, I think writing it, like being honest about where you are is sort of like you're at least taking something out of it. Like it was supposed to happen for some reason, like you're, you're treating it with respect. And I think that that immediately like, uh, a bad mood that you can't really control is bad because you think it's bad to be in that mood and so you're in a state of not accepting and the state of not accepting reality and the, the state that you're in is like very uh unpleasant 
but as soon as you're like writing about your state of mind you're sort of giving it space like it's supposed to be there and the feeling of just i'm sad but that's okay and like it's okay to be sad like it it's definitely very different from being sad and feeling like this is the worst i should be happy right now yeah, yeah. exactly also like you know finding a foe that you can't see is uh is near impossible but at least when you see it whether it changes how how it maybe it's worse than you thought but when you're looking mm -hmm. at it then you've got a starting point or you can at least pin it on the on the board and be like okay that's yeah. that's it that's what i'm up against okay i'll check in next week maybe it's worse maybe it's a little better but i but i've got i've got a, a point i can start at you know that i that i see yeah it's comforting to have have like a precise definition yeah, yeah. i think over the course of like the last several years like i've just be, been more purposeful in kind of recognizing feelings and stuff like that and i think even just you know acknowledging them is a, a bigger thing than just not like because i used to just be like oh well this is how it is and you know i was kind of taught to not talk about them or really anything like that so like when I did start talking about them, it was a whole process because they felt like, am I sharing too much or how much am I going to do? You know, how much am I going to tell people and this and the other thing? And then I got to the point where I just kind of 180 from the original and was like, I'm going to share all of it with people who I know can handle it or who are my, my friends that will listen and, you know, just be honest because there's no point in holding back what's actually going on if I'm wanting help or, you know, just, yeah, you know, so like people can understand me. Um, you know, so I, I definitely feel like it's it's just a good thing in general just to acknowledge it, and then that helps too because you're like, okay, well, here's this thing that I'm dealing with instead of oh, all the things, but can't talk about it. Right. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. Absolutely. You got another one? Oh yeah. Um, oh. Go ahead, sir. No, go on. Oh, okay. Um, so I wrote this one for my best friend. Uh, it was basically just, again, like a way for me to kind of tell him how much I appreciate him. Um, so I used like analogies and stuff like that to just explain, you know, the way that uh, he's so, um, Warmth like a flame that cannot burn, piercing darkness and clearing out shame, soft expressions, banishing shadows, shelter from the cold elements of life. Vision beyond surface and masks, alterations tailored to each heart. Collecting the bones that have fallen, carrying and holding them back to life. Silent cries for help answered loudly. Screams of pain embraced with calm. A behemoth of patience, understanding, love. This capture of protection like a shield. Dark valleys are made dwelling. Mountaintop views painted brighter still. A river a dam cannot hold, yet a wall keeping the ocean at bay. If all things could be fair, they would be. All the chosen curated with purpose. Wrapped up in eyes that see even more, warmth like a flame that cannot burn. Mm. Have you shared that with them? I yes. <laughs> oh man, that's that's awesome. I love the uh, the mountains brighter still. That's great. Yeah, your lines have such nice cadence to them, mm -hmm. despite like I mean I've talked to you about your poetry privately before, but like obviously you don't you don't usually use much of like a any particular rhyme scheme no i hate rhyming <laughs> yeah <laughs> but, but you are still like weaving together poetic cadence and it's it's i think by the end it just feels really like natural and like the like i think your last few lines in that one really stand out can you read them again if all things could be fair they would be all the chosen curated with purpose, wrapped up in eyes that see even more, warmth like a flame that cannot burn. Mm. It was beautiful, yeah. man. It just got a nice way that it goes. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> that uh, um, I I'm just like imagining you writing that and sitting there like thinking on on each of the lines, uh, kind of like a kind of like a, a, a painter painting a portrait. You're painting a portrait of them with words and you're picking out like the exact color and, and um, what you did choose just uh, 
I don't know. It, it paints the picture of someone who's just, who's been absolutely uh, monumental in your life. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Brian, do you have any tips or encouragement that you would like to share with the listeners before we go? Um, I don't know about tips, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I will say I kind of on your last note about how I don't rhyme. Um, personally, I just feel like rhyming like kind of limits me because um, I feel like it just makes it more difficult to convey a message that I might want to convey with like trying to find a word of mine. So I try to just kind of have whatever. Um, but I will say um, whether you think that it's good or not, just keep doing it anyway. Um, because like I said, most of my life, I've kind of struggled believing that I'm good at anything, um, that kind of thing. And for sure, I've looked at myself and been like, oh God, like, you know, what is this? Um, or, you know, even after like thinking I like something, looking back at it and judging my work, you know, obviously we're always our harshest critics, like that whole cliche, but it's totally true. Um, I just think like, if you're in the mood to write something, like, does it have to be some like epic masterpiece? No. Um, if, if it's something you like to do, then do it. Um, honestly, I think that's just it. Like, you know, just don't worry about whether it's good or not. Just keep doing it. Uh, because you're going to get something out of it regardless of whether you're getting published or someone you're sharing it with thinks it's great or not. Like, you know, it's, it's therapeutic in a way, I think, at least for me. So I think that it's... Absolutely. It's and great I, advice. I, I also speak in our language. Yeah, man. I, and I want to, um, I just want to encourage you, uh, and, and your bravery to, uh, write transparently and, um, and put it up on a public thing like this and, and to come on and talk about it. Um, I think it's very powerful, uh, and it's vulnerable and it's honest and it's beautifully done also. Um, and I, I really think that, uh, that your courage in this um, will affect people and uh, and it will help people. Uh, so I just want to encourage you to keep doing it, like stare the darkness in the face and write what you see. Thanks Absolutely. for coming on, Brian. Yeah, we thank you, you, Brian. We love you, brother. <laughs> we hope to see you again in the bar someday or some other promotional <laughs> giveaway or some sort. Absolutely, man. Looking forward to your next submission. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Have a good night, man. Hey, awesome. thank you so much for coming in, Brian. That was awesome. Yes. And again, Brian, thank you for your, your vulnerability and courage and uh, just opening up to us and um, really impressed at his his ability to tap into to his feelings and it, kind of what we were talking about at the very beginning of this, you know, mm -hmm. when you're you're trying to write something that's not how you feel. Yeah. Maybe that's a, maybe that's a, a sign that you need to write something else. You got something you need to get out. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's always good to hear from right guys, hear their perspectives, get little tips and get you. you we always grow in those interviews. So it's absolutely it's great to have them. Uh, yes. Next up, we're going into the challenges from last week. Wordsmith. We've got some new words that have been invented by, our friends back home, me and Micah, have brought some in. Uh, I'm going to start off here reading one of Anna's. All Anna, right. Anna sent in. So uh, the, chal the challenge was to create a word, smith yes. yourself a word with your anvil and hammer, mm -hmm. uh, and then to write a 50-word uh, little story or excerpt using that word. Yeah, just inc incorporate the word, you know? It's almost like yeah. an example sentence. All right, let's um, go. All right. <laughs> Pneumatopath or pneumatopathy. Uh, a person who is able to sense the emotions and life force of others. Example. I'm sorry I've kept this from you, but I have to tell the truth. I can sense emotions and life force. You're telepathic? Not exactly. I can't read thoughts. Even emotions are blurry. I'm technically a pneumatopath. I'm not even going to try to pronounce that. You're taking this pretty well, considering it's pretty weird. I'm demonically possessed, and I'm demonically possessed and predicting the end of the world. Nothing is weird anymore. <laughs> that, that, 
That is a sick little story sample right there. Like, I, would, I want to know more about those people. Yeah, you just get a, a little momentary glimpse there. <laughs> yeah, she did say that was an cool. excerpt from a different story that she has been working on. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah, um, I worked on five years ago. Yeah. Okay, so a pneumatopath, a person who is able to sense the emotions and life force of others. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um so yeah, not thoughts, just emotions can sense like if you're sad or um yeah happy. Uh let's see, and then and life force of others. That's interesting. New and pneuma breath path feel emotion yeah pneuma is breath and from it's from the greek for breath and then the path is for feeling or emotion right yeah very cool i love that pneumatopath Mm -hmm. and it sounds like that sounds like a word it does indeed you made a new a new word there I and think you we use have the one. Latin just like the pneumono ultra microscopic silico volcano codio. I use the same su- prefix there for breath. <laughs> yeah. Oh, true. Because it talks Pneuma. about that. That's yeah. a lung disease. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Oh, that's great. Full circle. Very good. Thank you, Anna. All right. So that's that's out there now. Everybody, you can use pneumatopath. It's official. It's right, guys. Official. Mm-hmm. Straight out the forge. So that one's hot. It's hot potato. That, that one's hot. That's a hot one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you may want to let that cool a little bit. Okay, so I'm going to read one from uh, from Sky. Prefinity. A sense of longing and grief arising from the belief that one exists in the statistical outlier of their own multiverse. That most of their nearly identical selves across other universes have a shared experience that one is not having. Uh, from the Latin uh, preteritus, lost, passed over, forgotten, and infinitum, infinite, infinity. And this is the submission. If the borders of, of space are expanding, and statistical patterns demanding, quarks and atoms repeat, and you and I meet in world after world without ending. A love that was stronger than gravity on average must hold through realities, but here I'm alone, unsent words on my phone, drowning in waves of profinity. I love this word. Mm -hmm. I am... Like just the multiverse theory is is hot on my mind right now, and I love. I saw. I watched. Uh, recently watched. Uh, what is it? Everything, everywhere, all at once. Yes. Same. Everything, everywhere, all at once, and just loved it. Like it was. Like I ate that up. Like I'm gonna. I'm definitely gonna be watching that a few times. But uh, this just hit. Like this just. I don't know. This struck a chord to me, and I think it's elegant, and I think. Um, it has a, a a a deep sense of longing, you know, like like what a what an existential mm-hmm. uh, 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 I don't know color to it. I just I I, I thought it was wonderfully done. Prefinity. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's the poem is is great. Perfectly kind of expresses it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It was huge picture and then like unsent words on my phone, like also bring it down to like yeah. granular and uh, mm-hmm. super relatable. But like, I don't know, just the whole thing. I think it was beautifully done. Way to go, Sky. Yeah. Good job. Um, we have last, lastly here from last one we had submitted was from Tim. We have ultigeniture, um, which is based on... There's n- there's no um like definition definition I don't think it's he's, he kind of explains it though and he says it's based it's a spin off the word primogeniture which is the right of the firstborn popular in feudal systems where the firstborn son is often bequeathed headship of his father's possessions ultigeniture is the right of the lastborn um that's what the word means and so ah. ultigeniture and there's a little poem here that uses it as an example. 
begotten of sin, beloved of God, executor of the book of life and its occupants, comfort of the elect, torment to the reprobate, harbinger of the hereafter, I inherit the divine folly of creation, the sculpture of em emancipated souls at its terminus. I am Azrael, angel of death. That does not use the word in it. <laughs> <laughs> I, lo I love the word. Yeah. So I, I, think he wrote, I, I think he wrote a poem about ultigeniture. Yes. Um, Got gotcha. you. Are, are used ultigenitor as the name of the poem. Maybe this is the definition. <laughs> Either way, I like it a lot. I think it's a cool, a very cool word. And in, the inheritor of like the of the last right. That's super cool. Yeah, yeah. the The right of the last born. The right Definitely of the last an interesting born. Thought and the the poem gives us some dark imagery to ruminate on <laughs> yeah <laughs> i love the skull kern of emancipated souls at its terminus uh, yeah let's go yeah it's dripping it's a, it's a very dripping poem i like it a lot did we have an example i don't think so Tim. no we don't, I don't have, have an example, have example. Tim. we need an example next time <laughs> but uh it was it it's was great I do yeah. like it a lot. Yes, thank you very much, Tim. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Here is mine. Uh, so I I I went back and forth uh, between a couple. I would the same meaning, but d between a few. I'll just get into it. We'll talk about it later. Um, okay. So, exolate to shed the soul of oneself. Her feelings and opinion her, her feelings and opinion were two things Lorta found to be unwelcome in her relationship with Talus. Once a font of expression and ideas, she found herself exolating to maintain peace with her betrothed, living years as but a quiet shell of her once vibrant self. That's really great. <laughs> you like it? Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> Eggs. So X. Uh, X prefix out of from soul, the non-physical part of a person, which is the seat of emotions and character, the spirit, and then uh, ating would be something that you're, you know, basically verb verbinating it, <laughs> <laughs> verbinating yeah. another word. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I like that. that, that I ended up going with. Uh, it was either going to be um, excitating with like psych as the word mm. um that would be the most modern spin but that also like psyche kind of everything i was i was i was reading about psyche if, if i really like picked the definition apart it seemed like it was more about being human and not being individual it's somewhat mm. like the human experience um, interesting and then or that's just how it weighed on me whenever I was mm -hmm. trying to pick it out. Right. And then I was going to do spirit because spirit was, uh, is basically came, came out spirit and soul have, have meant the same thing for a long time that they're, they're synonyms of each other and spirit came out before. Um, in, in fact, the definition of soul of spirit is the non-physical part of a person, which is the seat of the, of emotions and character, the soul. <laughs> and, uh, but I just didn't like how expirit, expiritating was. That was just like, it was too, I liked exolate. I thought that mm -hmm. was, it just felt good. And it felt like, yeah, uh, no, it feels essential. Like it, it feels like it's not, it wouldn't be the, the rarest word. Like it's like, it right. has like, it has a really kind of useful, place in yeah. like in sort of just social understanding i think and it's something that people describe using multiple words all the time yes that is exactly why i pinpointed it yeah i was searching a long time for words like that in these <laughs> last few weeks um oh man should i go awesome. do, or do yeah. you do it no that's it because i 
I've I've actually wrote a few words and I only did like one example sentence thing, but I had a few words that I was like choosing between. Okay. <laughs> um like I, real quick, I I've got I've got ten minutes. Yeah. But yeah. I'll I'll text you about that timestamp by the way, so we remember it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um demeration, a decrease in intelligence. Oh, nice. Okay, so how'd you build that? I just made it up. I didn't really build any of oh, them. Oh, nice. <laughs> Demeration. I just wanted them to sound realistic, so I just yeah. tried to come up with things that sound realistic. So what's the definition of that one again? De- to decrease in intelligence, or a decrease in intelligence. A decrease in intelligence, a demoration. I don't think okay. there's a word for like stupidifying, stupid, right. like becoming dumber. I don't think there's a word for it. De- like you have to kind of build it, deteriorating mentally. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, demoration. Demoration. Uh I like that. Uh, Plend, I came up with, which was to steal such a small amount of something that it won't be noticed, which was a definition I came up with for one of the, one of the dead words last, in the last episode. Yeah. (laughs) It was plend? Plend. Past tense, plent. Oh, nice, nice. I like that. And then the one that I ended up going with was Gribble, a prize that disappoints its winner. <laughs> That's great. Oh, what'd um, you win? Uh, it's just some Gribble. <laughs> yeah. So this is the little example for that. This better be worth it, Theo cracked. He adjusted the matted hide of his werewolf costume as they made their way up a massive switchback driveway. A minute later, they approached a manor atop the hill. Trick or treat! A hooded man unlatched the door and held out four tubes of toothpaste. Great. Nothing but gribble. (laughs) That's my favorite. That's my favorite. And it, like, it doesn't even, it doesn't need etymology. It just sounds like what it is. I love that. Like, it's almost onomatopoeic. (laughs) Thank you. That's really cool. (laughs) Oh man, I'll use gribble. Absolutely. <laughs> it's nothing but gribble. It's nothing but gribble. It's a poor prize. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh so words have been created this uh this this episode, and we invite you to uh chew on these words, throw them into a sentence with a friend, and then just nonchalantly say, Oh, you don't know what that means? Oh, it means to do this. And then just watch it watch and see how it lands. If they're like, What? That's stupid. You know, they'd be like, ooh, maybe that one doesn't work. Or maybe they're like, oh, I didn't know that. And you're like, ha, new word. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And Uh, we should get into quickly the challenge for next time. Yes. Yes. So um, I am particularly very excited about next episode. Uh, Our topic will be sci-fi. What is sci-fi? When did it come about? Uh, what's happening in sci-fi now? How do you write in sci-fi? Uh, yeah, so that's going to be... Science fiction. And so our challenge is going to be to write a science fiction story between 200 and 500 words. Yep. And uh, let's see. Yeah, I'm just really excited about it. I was about mm-hmm. to say it again, but... <laughs> let's see. Science fiction. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, but yeah. All right. Well, um, as always, it's a pleasure, Ben. Yeah. It's and good to see you today. It's good to see you too. And right, guys, thank you so much for your submissions and your new words. I'm going to mm-hmm. be using them. My my goal is to use every single one that we talked about uh, in the next week. I'll in probably your, work a few in today. With them all in your sci-fi story. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. And, and the dead words that were revived with John. <laughs> Uh, I'm actually hanging out with uh, with Josh Revercombe today. Wow, who, was, uh, who is a guest, and I'm just gonna bounce these these words off. He's not gonna he doesn't know he's my guinea pig, but he's gonna come over and he's gonna be hit yeah. with a barrage of so ah barrage. Words. <laughs> you felt it, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so many words. <laughs> All right, everybody. We love Uh, y'all. Happy writing. Get that chair time in. We'll see you later. Later. Bye. Bye.